in the readings that just took place between Deuteronomy 8 and Luke chapter 4, I hope you see a connection. It should be obvious. Today we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to have a reasonable faith in light of the Scriptures. Just to summarize, last week, for those of you who were here and those of you who weren't, I grounded an understanding of what it means to have a reasonable and biblical faith in a relationship with Jesus Christ. That you cannot have an appreciation of the word small w, that is to say the text or the scripture, without having a relationship grounded in the capital W word or the incarnation of all that's spoken, that is to say God in Christ. Seems obvious to me, it may not be obvious to everyone, but this is the fundamental relationship and fundamental connection that we have to faith and to faith as reasonable and to faith as derived from something credible, something inspirational, uh, something that directs us otherly, that directs us to God. Word, small w, word, capital W. I don't know if you read my epistles every week, such as they are. They don't compare to the Apostle Paul's, I'll grant you that, not on most any level, except I do wish you grace and peace many times. I do uh, tell you how delighted I am to be in your fellowship many times, and in that way I very much resemble the Apostle Paul. But I thought that I would actually reference this right now, just in case you didn't take time to read it or might find it lost after church before you've had a chance to read it, or you might throw it away. Today's sermon is the third in a series I've entitled A Reasonable Faith. I believe this topic is more relevant than ever, and that this is a must-have conversation for our congregation and for Adventist congregations worldwide. There are interesting trends, and I'm not going to go into all of those today, but there are interesting trends in our church that have developed over, well, since the uh, late 80s, actually, that have moved us towards fundamentalism. And I don't mean this in the classic sense of fundamentalism from the 1940s, if you know the school. I'm talking about a more rigid approach to the way in which we see faith. This has implications for our corporate belief structures and thus for what it means to be orthodox. Now, orthodox is a word that means in agreement with our statement of belief. Heterodox would mean to believe other than our statement of belief. Heterodoxy or it could be even heresy. Heresy would mean that we're at great odds with some statement of belief. But orthodoxy gets to be defined institutionally. We, we can contribute to that understanding, but it gets to be defined institutionally. And so this, in turn, affects who is empowered and credentialed and encircled as belonging within the denomination. So if you think of it in terms of how things work up the ladder of structure, We define ourselves as an entity, as a body, as a denomination, in part by what we say we believe. Yes? 27, 28 now, fundamental statements of belief. These are written in a way that are um, non-credal, and I'm going to get back to that because Richard Guy's father, Fritz, has done some significant work on this with the original book that was produced out of the Texas General Conference in 1980, Dallas. So orthodoxy becomes a tool for empowerment. In other words, if if you don't believe exactly the way that I believe on this particular thing, and and when I say that I, I'm speaking institutionally, I can use that as a way of discriminating against you, even if in the past that particular belief was held more loosely or was even not spelled out. And so what becomes Adventism as we continue to add to these beliefs and as we continue to refine them or add to them, we become even smaller in our focus as to who we are. Because if you have a broad general statement of belief, 
Let's just play with this for a minute so you understand what I'm talking about. If I said, in order to be a Seventh-day Adventist, this is what you believe. You believe in God, you believe in his son, Jesus Christ, you believe in salvation by faith through grace, and you believe the seventh day is the Sabbath. How many people do you think we could incorporate into our faith with those four beliefs? Huge numbers of people. Huge numbers of people would be part of that belief structure. But with everything we add to it, it becomes either looser in its adherence, which is the, uh, a kind of ideal of heterodoxy, that is to say, our religion becomes practiced a little bit differently in different parts of the globe. We have different understandings maybe of the meaning or the, the purpose of some of these doctrines based out of our education or our cultural experience. But the danger lies in somebody who wants to do a very strict reading of these being able to say, I belong because I salute the flag on 28 points. You don't. You have problems with 26, line 2. And therefore, because you're not as clear in your belief as I am in mine about these exact things, I'm going to define you as outside of my circle. Do you see the danger? Do you see the intrinsic problem with this? So what I observe and what I see is that those empowered and credentialed and encircled as belonging within the denomination, particularly within its leadership core, is becoming narrower and narrower in its ideology and focus, and in a sense, less broadly educated. Now, this should be of concern to you. As long as I'm your pastor, maybe you don't have anything to, much to worry about with that. <laughs> But you could conceivably have a pool of pastors to pick from in the future whose beliefs are so narrow that they don't even reflect your own. What would that look like? Do you want your pastor defining you out of this body? Interesting. Unfortunately, it also has huge implications for the intellectual viability of our church in the Western world, your children and mine. That should be of concern to you as well. So I need you to read between the lines. I'm not going to spell this out for you, not this week, not in the next few weeks. I'm not going to spoon feed you my opinions and my read, incomplete as it is, no doubt, of what's going on currently, but I would encourage you to start to look at what is happening in your denomination and to be clear for yourself whether you want to see this path getting smaller and narrower and less relevant and less capable of enfolding your children and their children, or whether you want to keep it non-credal and more open and able to handle the very narrow variety that we already encompass. My theme this week and through these last few weeks and into the future, assumes these things. So I'm just letting you know what my assumptions are. That faith and reason can and ought to have a relationship or at least be in dialogue. I don't think faith is irrational. And if it is, I, I suspect many of us would need to leave on that basis. I don't think that uh, faith practiced without reason sees much. I think it's blind. And that reason without faith leaves us inadequately equipped to deal with the complexity of reality, our lives, emotions, perceptions, and spiritual sensibilities. Reality is not encompassed in one discipline. If physics could describe all of reality, we wouldn't need psychology. If psychology was as adequate for describing what happens in social groups as sociology or across the globe in anthropology, we wouldn't have those disciplines either. We wouldn't have English and literature and discourse and rhetoric and all these different forms of speech and argument if they didn't each have their place in the world of discipline as well. Faith on its own is not of much value, and reason on its own might be worth not much more either. So that reason must shape and inform a biblical faith, number two, primarily through our reading and interpretation of the text. Remember last week I mentioned uh, a television show that I had just kind of glanced at in which the pastor, they were interviewing a couple of pastors who were advocating prostitution and or pimping, running houses of prostitution based on their read of scripture. 
I'm here to tell you, you can take the Bible and pretty much live any lifestyle you want to live. You can take the Bible and make it say whatever you think it ought to say. You can distort through reason of your own. This is a distorted, twisted kind of logic reason. The, the faith into about anything you want it to be. This is why I mentioned the week before that we have four legs on our stool, practically or ideally. We have our experience. We have our traditions. We have authority. And we have the scripture itself. So a significant reason that, uh, or excuse me, reason is a significant part of our witness in the world. Number three, how are educated people to make sense of a dogmatic faith wholly unconnected to the real worlds of science and education? How do we keep alive an ancient text in a modern context? So hopefully today I'll be sharing a few ways in which we might do that making sense of God's intent to save humankind in a heterogeneous and pluralistic world, which I think will require more of us than a quick, trite, or narcissic, narciss narcissistic reading of Scripture. So the reason we bring will be far more encompassing than clear logic. It will involve an engagement of heart, an engagement of head, and I promise will be much more fulfilling to all of us. So that was my letter to you. If you didn't read it, you've now got it. And uh, if you read it, I've expanded on it. So there it is. Let's go back to our text in Deuteronomy 8 and in Luke. Obviously, today I'm not going to give you exhaustive standards for how to read the Bible, and it's not a beginner's how-to class. I'm just directing you to a couple of ways and ways of thinking about Scripture that can bear fruit for you spiritually as you think about what it means. So Deuteronomy 8 says in the subject heading, Do not forget the Lord. Be careful to follow every command I'm giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. That's covenantal. That's a covenantal piece, a reminder of covenant. Okay, I, you obey my commands, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. Remember how the Lord God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. So we're, we're back to this God's leading these 40 years becomes a very significant motif here. Remember God's faithfulness and the way in which that time tested your faithfulness. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you or your ancestors had known, to teach you that people do not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during those 40 years. Now let's go back to the manna point. In the desert, where they were for these 40 years, there was not bread. There were no wheat crops, no barley crops, no crops with which to make a grain a harvest and grind it up into flour and make bread. And bread is a staple in the world. Whether you want to talk about it in terms of a wheat crop or a corn crop or a rice crop, grains are a staple worldwide. They had no bread. Jesus makes this uh, use of this motif in the New Testament as well, and we'll get to that. But the idea is very clearly expressed in this 40 years of wandering, the test is, will you remain faithful? It's not clear where your bread is coming from. It's not clear where your water's coming from. Your provision of your life is not seen to be sure. But will you obey and will you trust? Will you follow God's leading in the wilderness of your life? That's where the text is going. It says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, because when God speaks, it's generative. Do you follow me? It creates, it makes an action, it's a speech act. It does something. It's not just words hanging in space. It's words that move us to something or make something happen. And so in the context of wilderness, he speaks and there's water. 
He speaks and there's bread. It's generative. It's a creation act. And he provides. Flip over to Luke. Keep your finger in Deuteronomy. And Luke is not the only one with this particular uh, passage, but I chose Luke. And here we are looking at Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he, oh, I'm in John, not Luke. No wonder it didn't make any sense. You ever do that? That's how not to read the Bible, by the way. <laughs> I guess it happens to everybody. Luke 4, not John 4, sorry. We'll get it. This is the testing in the wilderness, which is what I was looking for. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan right after his baptism and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Where did Deuteronomy 8 take place? Wilderness. Where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. How long was Israel? 40 years. We have in Scripture a day for a year principle. There's a sort of interchangeability, if you will. I'm not saying Israel wandered for 40 days as Jesus did or Jesus for 40 years, but I'm saying that this 40 number is very important and very symbolic. You find it 40 years in Israel's experience and now 40 days in the Messiah's experience. Israel's in the wilderness being tested to see if they will obey everything God has commanded, and Jesus has now moved into wilderness time for 40 days to be tested to see if he will obey everything he's been he ate nothing during those days. What was Israel concerned about as they wandered in the wilderness? Where were they going to get water? Where were they going to get bread? And where were they going to get meat? It would be the generative word of the Lord that accomplished all of those for them, manna and quail and water from rocks. So when, oh, we'll get to it in a minute. He ate nothing during those 40 days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, People do not live by bread alone. And the last part is left off, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Is that familiar? Do we know where this story ends? Jesus is speaking to this moment of temptation not to draw, as God did in Israel's day, water from the rock, or to cause bread to snow down from heaven, or to send flocks of quail into the midst of the camp. But the temptation comes to turn a stone into bread, to abuse the divine power, to make it about mistrust and not dependence and not faith. And Jesus says, people don't live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, I'm not going to use all the fancy technical terms in theology for what this is. But if we think about this, who was the author of the book of Luke? Luke, Dr. Luke, you know this, right? All right, if Luke was the author, was he somebody who might have been familiar with the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, the Jewish Torah? Of course, he knew it very well. Now, he takes this story, and as he writes this event in Jesus' life, he uses Deuteronomy 8 as a matrix as an outline for what he's going to say in Luke chapter 4. Can you see that? Yes? No? It's obvious to me. Okay. Now, we could ask reasonable questions. Is it reasonable to assume or believe that Jesus, who presumably was not inexorably obese, 
that he could live 40 days without food. Is that a reasonable sensibility for a human being? Probably not. Okay. And if he did, it's not clear that he would have the strength to come back from that experience. Now we're talking about a human Jesus here, yes? God can do anything within reason. God, it has to fit his description as God. God cannot do evil, obviously, right? And he can't do things that are logically impossible, like turning a, like making a round square or a square circle. Those are just categorical sorts of things God doesn't do because it's not, it makes no sense. That changes the definition of what it is if he does it. Okay, I'm digressing. Get a hold of yourself, Greg. Come back to the point. We have this matrix from Deuteronomy 8, and we bring it over to Christ's experience of being tempted in the wilderness. And what do I want to get out of this? Well, for myself, it isn't, it is very possible, and I want to grant this, it's possible that God performed a miracle and sustained him mysteriously in 40 literal days of no food and water. But normally a human being is going to die somewhere between three and eight days after no water. And most human beings will not be able to go an entire 40 days without food. That's the outer limits of starvation for the human body. So I don't know that the feature of this that's most important is the question of whether God enacted a miracle in the body of Christ to make this number work literally. In fact, if we read it carefully, I'm not sure the literal number is important at all, except as it connects to Israel's experience. Why is it that Dr. Luke is framing this story the way he has? Because the response as he has it of Christ in the wilderness goes back to Deuteronomy 8. And he's paralleling the experience of the people of Israel in the fulfillment of the Messiah and the life of Christ. Can you see it? Or am I talking to the wind? I know you can see it. And I'm so proud that we have that capacity together. The devil said, if you're the son of God, tell the stone to be bread. And Jesus said, it is written, people do not live on bread alone. Did Jesus pass the test in the wilderness that Israel failed to pass? Yes. How many from Israel made it into the promised land? Two. Caleb and Joshua. Anybody know what Joshua means? The Lord saves. You see, the Bible is speaking to us. In your 40 days, are you going to be faithful? In your wilderness, are you going to be faithful? Are you going to do what the Lord commands you to do? Follow his leading. Are you going to have the kind of faith that says, he will provide according to the word of the Lord? So, a reasonable faith comes from a reasonable look at Scripture. My faith, just so I'm just sharing with you, and you're welcome to a different conclusion, that's part of the heterogeny of being a congregation, the difference, the mix of what it is to be a congregation. We make room for one another. My personal take on this is not so much that the 40 days and 40 nights of Jesus and his starvation or lack of food and water in that is such an important feature. But for me, as I read this, the connection to the story of Israel and his fulfillment of something that they were not able to fulfill is meaningful and important. You see, when Jesus can be our righteousness, when we fail, that's important. When he can fulfill all that God asked of humanity and we cannot, that's important. Yes? So for me, as I read this passage, I could, we could have a very sort of literal discussion. Was Israel actually 40 years in the wilderness? Was Jesus actually 40 year, uh, days and nights in his wilderness? Did it rain for 40 days and 40 nights at the time of the flood? I don't know. That, those are the numbers given us in Scripture. But I think the number itself, the literal read, is less important than what the text is trying to tell us spiritually. Does that make sense? Or have I just stepped on a landmine so big, kaboom, I'm gone and our, our uh, minds are not, not able to, to move on. I selected this passage as a teaching tool today 
it helps us understand some of the ways in which we might do justice to reading Scripture. You see, I've said this before a thousand times, and I just want to be clear. The Bible wasn't, first of all, written in English. And if you thought that it was, I'm sorry. There's an ancient text here, and English is one of the more recent translations. Before English, the Bible was commonly known in the Western world in Latin and in the Eastern world in Greek. And the Latin Septuagint was translated from the the Greek before it. And there were schools of texts that arose, schools of religion actually that arose shortly after the time of the apostles. There was a religious center in Alexandria, Egypt, in Constantinople. Constantinople uh, on the eastern side, in Crete. And the seven churches were sort of areas of, of religious concentration, but particularly Jerusalem and Rome. Churches arose there in which whole bodies of texts were copied and written and read and understood, and certain texts belonged to one region and not another. You've probably watched the overwhelming and and bewildering number of series on TV about the Bible and the missing books of the Bible and some of the stuff that you've never heard of and claims maybe that Jesus was married. And, uh, you know, we just go on and on with these these television programs that are, are sending new information our way. And I'm not here to say that they're all wrong or don't have useful information. But there's a whole historical context to how we got this book. Is there wisdom we can gain from traditions that involve books outside of this one? Probably. Could we write a definition of inspiration large enough to include materials beyond Scripture? Probably. The question is an understanding of how it is that we've gotten what we've gotten, how it is that we have what we have. So the original language of Scripture in the Old Testament was Hebrew, but guess what? It wasn't just Hebrew. There was Hittite, Akkadian, Chaldean, Babylonian, other words written in there that are not native to the Hebrew language. Very, very skilled biblical scholars these days study all of these cuneiform and ancient languages and have a very clear understanding or much clearer understanding than scholars even a hundred years ago about where these texts come from and what the best translation of them might be. And when we get to the New Testament, Jesus himself did not speak Greek, per se, on a common level, or Hebrew. He spoke Aramaic every day. He could read Hebrew. He knew it well from the scriptures that he read in the synagogue, and he could read in Hebrew. And he could speak Greek if necessary in the the world in which Hellenized as it was, in the world in which he lived. But very probably his everyday language was Aramaic. And so when we get a quote from Jesus It's very likely Aramaic translated into Greek, and so forth. Well, any of you who speak two languages know that translation has its own set of changes. Things change as they move from one language to another, if slightly. Nuances might be slightly different. So the problem comes in how do we get to language that's as close to the original as possible? And there are all sorts of tools for doing this, and I won't go into them. But this has value, and to deny that it's true or that it has value is problematic. So what might go into our read of Scripture? First of all, sort of humble recognition that we've received this book as a gift to us. Highly, highly valued. Studied more than any other text, sold more than any other text in all of history. Scrutinized beyond belief and found to have integrity in so many ways historically and otherwise. But it also contains a variety of kinds of literature, doesn't it? How many of you read Shakespeare the same way that you read Newsweek? Anybody here do that? How about a good biography on the life of Franklin Roosevelt? Do you read that the same way that you do Helpful Hints from Heloise? Do you read, or when you see a movie like uh, something apocalyptic, 
I don't know, Deep Impact or, you know, one of these sci-fi movies of the meteor coming to Earth, something like this. When you watch a movie like that, is it the same for you as a romantic comedy? Yes? Oh, you're a little different than I am if that's the case. Maybe I need to go to more of a contrast. Do you watch American football the same way you watch Alfred Hitchcock? You do not. And you laugh because it's so obvious that all of these are different types of things and that we need to approach them differently. And within Scripture, it's the same way. We have poetry. We have case law. We have historical renderings or chronicles of what took place by the, uh, from the chronicler's point of view in a court or in a king's chamber or government. We have records of wars and civilizations moving upon one another. We have prophetic utterances renouncing sin in the people as the prophets saw it and foretelling either their doom or the blessings of God if they would turn their lives around. We have letters of a concerned pastor to his congregation in Ephesus or in Philippi or in Corinth. A pastor deeply concerned about the moral and spiritual well-being of the people in that city, the people coming to his church a pastor deeply concerned that they might live honorably before the God who called them and redeemed them. We have visions and terrors of beasts and unimaginable things to come in apocalyptic literature. We cannot read these all the same way. We must give them each their due if we're going to read the Bible reasonably and then from the Bible, draw a reasonable faith. If any of you has any doubt that this book leads us to the one true God, to the Christ who loves us and made us and redeems us and saves us, read it. You'll come to the inescapable conclusion that the Christ of Scripture's is worth your love, your adoration, your following, and your service. Worth your all. But as we read the text together, let's bring all the tools we can that we might have a reasoned reading and thus a reasonable faith. May the word of Scripture and the God who inspired it speak into our hearts and lives by his word, small w, and through his word, his Son, capital W, Jesus Christ, we praise you. Amen. Amen.